Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore, and I'm excited to announce that we are kicking off our spring fundraising campaign tomorrow. After you make any gift to the spring campaign during the month of May, we will send you a link to access additional Sermon Brainwave content. This includes presentations by the Sermon Brainwave team, along with some of your other favorite Working Preacher contributors at this year's Festival of Homiletics. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our text for the fifth Sunday of Easter this year falls on May 7th, uh, 2023. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. The psalm is the 31st Psalm, verses 1 through 5, and then 15 and 16. The epistle reading is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. And our gospel is the gospel of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And when we're reading through this section, I just always get excited because I'm going to sit back and let Caroline start us on John. Uh, uh, well, okay. If you insist, Joy. <laughs> Twist my arm. <laughs> Twist my arm. No, you know, here's the thing I, I was thinking about in particular. I mean, I know we talk about this. I, I, I know we, I feel like I say this every time now. I know we talk about this every year, but I've been thinking about it a little bit more this year. I'm work, I'm going to be working on an article uh, for a journal which focuses on the farewell discourse as Easter preaching and Easter proclamation, resurrection preaching. And because every year at this point, right, in, in our Easter season, fifth Sunday of Easter, we move into the farewell discourse. You know, we have, we have Thomas and, and this year we had the road to Emmaus and then, uh, and then we have a go to, to John 10 for Good Shepherd Sunday. And then we move back into the farewell discourse. This year, year A, the select this uh, selection, uh, selections from John 14. So this week and next week. And then the seventh Sunday of Easter is always the high priestly prayer. Year B, we do 15, chapter 15, the the uh, vine and the branches. And then year C, we dabble in a little bit of 13, a little bit of, and then a little bit of 14. And so I think I, I want to invite preachers this year to pause for just a minute and think about that homiletically, mm -hmm. that we are now going backward in time, of course, to prior the arrest, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. And in a lot of John scholarship, there's, a, well, in John scholarship, there's a kind of sort of a consensus or conversation, maybe not a consensus, but conversation around the fact that these are, these words are not only Jesus parting words to his disciples, you know, the farewell discourse, I'm, I'm leaving you, but also his interpretation of the events of the hour, mm -hmm. his interpretation of the death and his, his arrest and his crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension. Mm -hmm. And so what difference does that make to hear Jesus? A similar kind of pattern happens in Lazarus where Jesus interprets the sign before the sign happens. Mm -hmm. And so what difference does it make that, that we are hearing these words as Jesus helping the disciples experience with what is to come? And, and so that, and when Jesus says in chapter, in verse two, uh, in my father's house, there are many, you know, abiding places. That's not rooms. It's not mansions, but abodes drawing on mene and meno. 
if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And that I go is the death, the resurrection, and the ascension, this all all encompassing fulfillment of the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to start with that uh, and and just to invite in, invite preachers into that kind of place of hearing them hearing their listeners hearing Jesus words and how does that help them hear the resurrection differently mm -hmm. uh, and what the resurrection means um, and per particular particularly the resurrection with the cross remaining mm -hmm. the cross doesn't go away in the resurrection it's still there and so do you hear these words differently because of that perspective so that's just a first I have a few other things to say but <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there initially and see what you all thought about that I appreciate that I'll um take a similar kind of lead when we turn to uh, the Acts text. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know that we've, in a while, done that kind of long stretch to uh, remind us that uh, things have happened to set up this moment and things are going to continue to happen. Uh, it's, um, it, it's kind of a reminder that uh, the for Star Wars fans, the first episode uh, is um, not the first one we saw, or for me, the we would be back when I was in high school, um, but it's actually episode one, which would be the Phantom Men Menace. But that's not the whole story. That's not the end of the story. That's a setup for the rest of the story, which continues beyond that first episode I watched that was the first one that introduced the series to the world. And in many ways, we as uh, readers of scripture have to remember that each episode that we're reading is set in this larger context. And so uh, I think uh, reminding our, our, uh, our preaching colleagues uh, that that's how we read the text in, in order to prepare to preach, but it's also how we want our listeners to hear it. Um, uh, to be able to recognize that uh, this isn't a single promise where um, I get this big mansion when I die up in the clouds. Um, uh, but this is actually a promise of God's peace that has been made evident in the life of Jesus. And Jesus had to suffer. And we have to wait but we wait with this incredible promise. And so Jesus here is saying, would I have made these statements to you if they weren't true? If it wasn't so? If the promises of God were not to be held to? Um, for me, that's the statement that, that holds out for me, that tone of Jesus confirming all and as you've just done, um, set in all that has happened in the life of Jesus and will happen as we wait for Jesus' return. I really like where you two have taken the conversation because it gets at how do we read this text in Easter as opposed to in Holy Week, for example, which mm -hmm. is where it's you know set in the gospel. And, and what, does that, what does that mean? And it's a text that has so many lures, um, things that a preacher thinks they have to deal with, right? No one comes to the father except through me. How am I going to explain that? Uh, whatever, you know, you can do greater things uh, than what I've done. How am I going to explain that? Are there these things in there that you think, oh, this is going to be, here's a theological question I'm going to get, if not during the sermon, at least during coffee hour. Uh, um, there's also this challenge in a lot of Easter preaching that makes it sound like, almost uh, we're worshiping resurrection as a principle or we're worshiping a Jesus who's really just a literary construct. And so the mm -hmm. challenge is to bring us back mm -hmm. into the first century and experience that again. And I would say that Easter preaching, especially by the time we get to the fifth Sunday is very much about where is the risen Christ among us now? How is the risen Christ active now? And that's whom we worship. We don't worship a, a literary figure. We worship a living, active, Christ. And so that just 
I don't know if I have any answers about this particular text, but that's just a different way into thinking about as a preacher, where do I begin my sermon and where, what am I preaching to? What's the moment? Um, and especially in a text like this, right? Where even place has been so flattened in so many ways mm -hmm. where it's, we're talking about coordinates or location. And I think place is a much more evocative <laughs> relational term. Um, about connectivity and things like that. Yeah. So there's so much in here. I, I guess what I'm saying finally is don't get um, ensnared by the questions you think you have to answer because the text is rather mysterious, but find some of that mystery and start to work it as a means of introducing people to a Christ who's active and present uh, today. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's that's really helpful, Matt. And I also it makes me think about one of the sent one of the verses that you mentioned about like what do you do with verse 12 you know very truly i tell you the one who believes in me will also do the works that i do and in fact will do greater works than these and you know it's sort of on the on the front end you're like yeah but uh okay you <laughs> changed water into wine and you healed a man born blind and you raised lazarus from the dead and yeah i'm not think i don't think i'm cut out for that uh but but I think what you're saying helps help, I think, is an important aspect, particularly into this verse, in that the meaning of the resurrection is, is as you said, like the recognizing the, the risen Christ at, alive today, at work today, and, and, and present with us today. And, and as you said, not a literary construct, right? Or not a, not a, a, a theological, that we reduce resurrection to a theological doctrine, uh, you know, something in which we have to believe in order to, you know, gain our mansion or, or in, you know, I hope I have a lot of bathrooms kind of, <laughs> kind of mentality. But this particular verse is it, what's at stake here, I think, for John and, and for John's Jesus is that that resurrection presence, Jesus is going to rely on us for that as well. Mm -hmm. That uh, that that we are we are going to be called, and we'll see this for uh, we'll see this for Pentecost Sunday in John. But we are going to be called to reveal. And uh, and be empowered by the uh, the full story of God's love in and for the world, mm -hmm. and yeah. so that 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 resurrection, doing that greater works, are indeed are indeed works that are embodying the promise of uh, the resurrection here and now. So I think that's really I think that's helpful. Uh, I, I, this is a wonderful uh, uh, exchange. Uh, uh, Matt, you just did a wonderful mic drop back there that was uh, Jesus is the answer statement. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, One of that I, in Sunday school. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Yeah, but uh, this um, this distinction between when we're reading the text and how how we interpret it in light of you know what season we are, we're always in a um, second reading. Uh, at least a second reading, and we're always in a post-resurrection understanding. And if what we do is because of that positioning, simply say, let me find a rule to pull out of, of this uh, event and focus in on what that rule, uh, that line, that word means, we lose the dynamic um, experience that cause people to say, not only do I need to tell others what Jesus said and what we experienced when we were with Jesus, we need to preserve it so that should Jesus tarry, others will know. And for us to know is not to know what it's been in the history of interpretation, but to recover, take a look at what happened and what was happening and why it was happening. And that just takes us all the way back to the promise of God from creation. God is mm -hmm. forming a people, you've heard me say this before, with whom the spirit so evidently abides that the world has hope. And God never gave up on that intention. And so as you said, Caroline, it's our task now to be that people 
And we do it because we have this trustworthy promise from the one whom God sent and who made it possible for that generation and subsequent generations to keep that hope alive. Yeah. I think I, I would say one more thing and then we probably should go on, <laughs> uh, but it be, uh, only because I think you mentioned this too, Matt, but then also what you were just saying, Joy, is that John 14, 6, which of course is, is historically misinterpreted and misused and, and exceedingly um, hurtful and harmful and actually simply incorrect ways. The one thing I'll say about it is it is really related to our conversation that what John is concerned about here uh, and G, you know Jesus, <laughs> Jesus through John is helping his followers recognize and name their God and the distinctiveness of their identity as a people of God yeah. and, and the particularity of that. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, we equate that sentence with, uh, with exclusivism mm -hmm. and it's not exclusivity as it is particularity. And so uh, that really, really relates to, I think our, I think our comments already help us think about like that, to recognize the risen Christ and, and the works of love in the world take on a kind of particularity as Christians. Mm -hmm. And so that's what in part Jesus is inviting his followers into. So. That provides me a great way to move into Acts. <clears throat> uh, as I no, said, I really want to hear that because um, I'm trying to find a segue into Acts. And <laughs> And you just provided it because, as I said, Sorry, uh, that, that history, uh, that 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 history of context, um, we, um, I, I wonder sometimes if our reading text and looking for um, ethical principles or theological doctrines has caused us to. Um, create communities uh, or societies, especially, especially those who, who learned how to read through being in, 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 in churches on Sunday, um, has taught them to take events out of context. So I'm going to do exactly what I'm afraid of uh, that, that might help uh, our listeners understand what I'm saying. Um, the stoning of Stephen can look like the um, uh, a, a a moment where a, a crowd of people respond violently uh, to a single incident and we can look at it amid all of the random killings acts of violence that we're experiencing right now in our own culture, in, in, in our own neighborhoods. This, this isn't something that is just limited to uh, an African-American experience. Uh, it, it certainly in the last few weeks has been exposed that we have become a violent culture. And what is the reason for this violence, um, this deathly violence? Now, our listeners like you and, and Matt, Caroline, are probably saying, okay, Joy, where's that segue? Well, it's what caused Stephen to be stoned. It was not what he was given as his task to do, feed tables, uh, to care for, um, uh, you know, practice social justice among the hungry and the homeless. It was his testimony to who his God is. And that testimony was so disruptive. What happened to him is precisely what happened to Jesus. And the question for us is, why are people offended by us? Are they offended because in a post-theistic context, we would dare to say, not only do we believe in God, but we believe that God is up to good and it's evident now. 
And folks are like, no, 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 that's problematic. That's problematic for the way that my denomination has fixed our exclusion. That's problematic for my nation, which has fixed our exclusion. That's problematic for me personally in terms of how I want to live my life without the limitations of government or uh, a, a religious institution. And when people are attracted to the God that we bear witness to, we're going to see Jesus when they're attacking us. We're not going to simply say, this is a justice issue. This, we're not simply going to say, this is an ethnic issue, which are we ways to read how Stephen had to be chosen to wait on tables in the first place. But we're going to put it back in this larger context that said, this is a theological exposure that we believe there is a God and that this God is active in the world for everyone's good. And that's going to disrupt the imagination of people nationally, religiously, and in our own communities. And that makes this story in context a much more evocative wor wor word, a much more evocative word than it simply being a justice issue. Mm -hmm. I hope that, I hope you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, uh, it's such a shocking scene and it's yes. not easy to preach. Um, for a whole host of reasons. And it's, especially after where we've been the last four weeks in Acts with, with the, the preaching to Cornelius, then three Pentecost stories, two from the sermon, and then the, um, the creation of the community, all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is going to be a hostile, <laughs> a hostile context for the preaching of the word of God. That's part of the church's witness bearing uh, is is going to be lethal and, and full of conflict. And of course, so much of Acts is about that. Like you said, Joy, this, this kind of clash of religious imaginations or theological imaginations that, that, that take place. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I've written on this. I've read so much about this passage. It's so r tough to think about where do you come in with a sermon that's not just about... Um, villains and heroes or something like that. And I, I really, I love what Amy Oden did with this mm -hmm. in the commentary on the website where she really didn't write a commentary. She wrote a sermon. Um, and that's, I say that appreciatively, not, not critically, where she found, you know, one, one detail about Stephen's gaze mm -hmm. and calls it the prophetic gaze. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, so where do prophets set their eyes and for him, it's on Christ. And but then what's brilliant about what she did, where it became really sermonic, was saying so much of the way we think about prophetic stances are about fixing your gaze on your on the enemy or on the threat or on the whatever. And she said that just um, amplifies the polarization that's already such a part of our culture that we're eager to seek out our theological or ideological enemies and make them, but she said, you become prophetic if you just simply keep your gaze on, on Jesus himself. So, I mean, I would never copy somebody's sermon that I found online, but it's an interesting model of how you might uh, take a tough passage and, and find a, not just a detail, but something that's got incredible theological potential to, to explore and to play with. Um, Did Matt just do another Jesus is the answer mic drop? <laughs> uh, something's up today i don't know it's a weird day it is we are recording this in late april and it is still snowing in minnesota so there's all sorts of things are yeah not that i'm against talking about jesus but you know <laughs> I, I, dropping. I, I'm, I i'm usually when i drop the mic joy it's usually because i have literally dropped the mic <laughs> and fumbled it as opposed to you know doing the well i think and maybe that's where, yeah, I, I agree with that too. And with regard to finding, you know, that the, the prophetic, that the prophetic, the, the prophetic voice is not, not simply words, but a stance in the world. And, and I wonder then if the, then if that were the direction you were going to go then, and even in part with, even in part with John, 
14 and the, 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 the troubling spirits and the, and the tension and the concern there, uh, you know, troubled hearts and such that the Psalm becomes a language for how, how does one maintain that gaze or what, what is, what is it, what does it look like or what does it mean to have your gaze upon, uh, upon God and it, and it's seeking refuge. It's inclining, it's asking for God's ear. It's, it's committing your spirit to God. And so I think that's why I would use the Psalm where you get to go in that direction as mm-hmm. to here you have the Psalmist actually in many ways embodying <laughs> what Peter does, um, is, is, is the gaze upon God and absolute trust in God. Took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what I did with the Psalm. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing in this Psalm, or at least in these verses that says, you know, look at what they're doing to me. Look at what they're doing to me. Look at that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, um, the, the threat is present, but it's this, it's an address directly to God, which is, yeah. Yeah. which is significant, right? That's what confession is in so mm-hmm. many ways. It's not just speaking about God, but speaking to God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would suggest that that's how we read Peter. Um, that we have this whole uh, contextual um, historical um, background that turns our eyes upon Jesus, um, the living stone, um, the um, reality of the suffering. Uh, I'm trying to think of the exact word that you the 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 that you used, uh, Matt. Uh, but the hostility that comes for the church after having read all of these um, coming together scenes in in Acts uh, uh, from Pentecost and Cornelius, and then and now this hostility and this violence, and and Peter continues that. But if we read it with the imagination that we've just discussed. I think it also is turning our eyes to the living stone and that that would allow the message from any of the texts this week to focus on who is our God and what is our God doing in the world and that we will trust this God even in the midst of hostility. And then what become, you know, where does that come from? Where does that strength come from? Where does that resolve come from? There's so much in this text that is uh, about identity, right? Identity formation, Mm -hmm. know who you are, Mm -hmm. um, which is also a very Pauline way, not just, you know, here in in first Peter, uh, a way of talking to the church or instructing the church, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not so much about here, all the, here's all the stuff you got to do. I really wish you would try harder, et cetera, et cetera but it's always be who you are, right? Or live out who you are. And so the way this passage ends with some of these strong statements um, of identity is really crucial so that a preacher is not perceived as putting the, you know, the cart before the horse, right? Or making it all about, you know, here are the ethical norms for this community that we all have to live up to, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm.